Welcome if you're joining us now. We're starting off with um with a poll just to see what brings you here today. So if you're here, hopefully you're interested in platform co-ops. That's what we'll be talking today. Um, but we wanted to get a sense of who's in the audience. Um, so you'll see in the chat, there should be a link to participate in the Slido, or I'll just show my second slide. You can participate simply by going to slido.com and using the, the code hashtag PCW2023. Great. So it looks like mostly people are here curious because they want to find out more about platform cops, uh, but also some of you are supporting people who are setting up um, businesses in general and want to find out more. So thanks. That's really useful for us to know. OK, so I will start the presentation now. Um, and hopefully a few more people might be joining, but I think it's a good moment to start now. So welcome everyone. Um, as mentioned, this this uh, webinar is about platform co-ops and uh, platform co-ops as a route to an ethical digital business. Um, this webinar is hosted by Cooperatives UK and Cooperative Development Scotland and Scottish Enterprise, and it's made possible also thanks to the Cooperative Bank. Um, I'll let, go through what we'll cover today. Um, so I'll. I'll give a brief introduction and then I'll hand over to Suzanne Orchard from Cooperative Development Scotland and Scottish Enterprise, who will tell us a bit more about their work. And then I'll be, give a presentation of around 20 minutes about what we mean by platform co-ops, the support that's available to, to start one, and what are the sort of steps that people take when, when they're starting one. And then we've got two great speakers um, from people who are actually running platform co-ops. So we've got Jennifer Bird from Sinalize and Kaylee Reed from Open Food Network. And I'll introduce them better when um, we get to their presentation. After that, we'll have a QA. and a um, Unfortunately, because we're in webinar format, we can't hear, we can't see on screen, but please use the chat to uh, put your questions either directly to the panelists uh, do do it also while we're speaking, and then we'll just collate them um, at the end and, and, and uh, try to address some of them. Um, I think that's all for now. Um, I'll just introduce myself briefly before I hand over to uh, Suzanne. Um, so my name's Vika Rogers. I run, I, I work at Cooperatives UK, and I run uh, what is called the Unfound Programme, and I've been involved in this for the last three years, which is set up specifically to support platform co-ops. Um, I'm also currently interim head of cooperative business development. So I look overlook sort of the business support that we provide to particularly to startups and, and conversions. I'll hand over now to Suzanne. I think I'll stop sharing. So thanks, Vika. Hi there, everybody. Um, sad I can't see all your faces. Um, but welcome, big warm welcome nonetheless. I'm Suzanne Orchard. I work for Cooperative Development Scotland, part of Scottish Enterprise, as, as, as Vika pointed out. And I just wanted to take a few minutes just to um, tell you a little bit about CDS, who we are, what we do, and why we're partnering with Co-ops UK to bring this, this webinar to, to you today. So for those of you who don't know, and I always assume people don't know, because it's a mistake to assume people do, um, Co-op uh, CDS, was set up um, by the Scottish Government in 2005 to ensure co-ops and employee-owned business models were factored into the government's approach to economic development. So we provide dedicated support around that. So we are a government agency, unlike uh, co-op UK, the, the, the membership body, we're very much uh, funded um, by government and we're based here in Scotland. So we're remitted, remitted to raise awareness of co-ops and employee-owned business models, as well as providing support to consider options set up. And also recently we branched out into helping co-ops, existing co-ops to sustain and grow. Um, there's a number of other areas to our remit, including research and, 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 and policy, but the awareness raising and the practical support are really um, our key areas of, of focus. So we do sit within Scottish Enterprise which can be really, really confusing. We all have Scottish Enterprise email addresses, but we very much provide a pan-Scotland service. 
Um, so we work right across the country, work very, very closely with the other enterprise agencies in, in Scotland. For those of you who don't know them, that's Highlands and Islands Enterprise and the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency to support them to, de to deliver um, their economic development remits, which can be easier said than done because they've all got different approaches and styles. Hi, are very much community orientated, whereas SE very much more um, an innovation focus. So that's a little bit about who we are, what, how and who we support people. Um, so we very much support um, a whole range of, of, of types of projects and, and businesses. We're, we're often sort of lumped into the category because we sit within SE that we only support large or high growth ventures. That just isn't the case. CDS are able to support anything from small grassroots um, social orientated not-for-profit projects and, 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 and co-ops all the way up to, to the large commercial um, for-profit projects and, and co-ops and also anything, any combination of the two and anything in between. Um, we support a whole range of different types of co-ops including community cooperatives, consortium cooperatives, worker platform as we're here today to, to explore as well as employee ownership and we provide free support um, free uh, practical sort of tangible support to explore those initial options around is this the right um, model for you um, and if, if it is and it's something you'd like to progress with we can support to help you to actually set up or indeed transition from your current business model into a cooperative or employee owned model. Um, as I said, we've branched out more recently into helping existing cooperatives, which has been really, really exciting. And we've had some, some really fabulous projects come up um, through the pipeline around helping existing cooperatives to look at their structures, look at uh, becoming more sustainable, look at growth um, opportunities. Um, it's also been a fabulous opportunity to get closer to the existing and, and, and very established um, co-ops and sector already in place in Scotland. Um, lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge that we're working in partnership with Co-ops UK today. Our, our relationship goes back a, a number of years. It's not a new thing at all, but we're really here to, I suppose, maximise and ensure that, that, that you have access to, to both our experience, our resources and our knowledge um, about, about the sector, particularly here, here in Scotland for the benefit of, 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 of you. Um, it's really is just an introduction. It's a taster. This isn't a fait accompli. It's not a one and done. We're not all going to disappear off the radar after. And I would really encourage um, anybody who's interested or anything, uh, anybody who's uh, been ignited or, um, you know, had, 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 not, had an idea sparked by today to, to absolutely get in touch. I, I, for one, and I know folks at Co-ops UK as well, would be delighted to continue the conversation um, around how to take the, the, the next steps with you. I will be um, on the chat throughout the session and make sure my, my contact details are, are there for everybody. Uh, but without further ado, I'll hand back over to Vika and we can, we can kick off and hear about this fabulous model. Thank you, Suzanne. Yes. Um, okay, so thank you for that presentation uh, of the support that is available. Um, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen again. This works. Okay. Uh, can I just have a thumbs up from another panelist that my slides are visible? Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about platform co-ops. Um, before I move on to actually talking about platform co-ops, I just wanted to make sure that we all had a good understanding of what we mean by a co-op. Uh, just as Suzanne was saying before, we don't want to assume that everyone already knows about co-ops. Um, so we um, a cooperative is a business or organization that is owned and controlled by its, member, its members to meet their shared needs. And the members of a co-op can be a really a very different types. They can be customers, employees, residents or suppliers, but they all have a say in how the co-op is run. 
They can also be in different sectors. So they could be pubs, energy suppliers, taxi firms, etc. Uh, this is just a, a, a list of some of the ones that we have in our membership. Um, they there are about seven seven thousand co-ops that contribute to the UK economy, and they contribute over forty uh, billion. So members are really at the heart of every co-op. They're the foundation of every co-op, and it's why the co-op exists in the first place. So the purpose drives who the members should be, and vice versa. And the members own their co-op, and they choose what they can do with the profits. They can invest. To, for the benefit of the co-op, but they can't invest just to uh, make a profit. Most importantly, members have an equal say in the, in the co-op. Um, now, before I talk about what we mean by platform co-ops, um, I just wanted to give a broad definition of what we mean by a platform business. Now, there isn't an official definition of, of what a platform business is, but it is, um, uh, it really became a term that emerged in, in the last uh, 15, 20 years to describe how technology was transforming business and creating and generating new business models. And so this is quite a broad definition of what a platform business is. A platform business is a business that uses a digital platform to trade, connect people and or pool resources and data. And this is just a definition that we find useful to use for this kind of um, business. Now, we're, these type of businesses have become much more present and dominant in our lives, particularly after the pandemic. They allow us to connect with loved ones. They allow us to do our daily activities from ordering groceries to booking a restaurant uh, or booking care. Um, so we all have gained a lot of benefits from the platforms. But um, unfortunately, what is emerging is also the, the negative effects associated to some of these platforms. So I'm just gonna give a broad sort of overview of, of some of the issues that have emerged. First of all, platforms um, collect and hold large amounts of user data and don't always disclose what they do with it. And they gain immense power due to the huge amount of data they hold and the large profits that they make. Um, they often also, uh, use algorithms that contain bias that can skew the way platforms operate but also the way that they're designed and they interact with their users means that they have a lot of top-down control um, that impacts um, users and that the terms of the users can unilaterally change from one day to the other. Unfortunately, they also are undermining communities and workers' rights, so they facilitate dependency on precarious income streams and working conditions, and they have uh, shown to be openly opposing collective actions. Um, some of them also impact local communities by introducing disruptive economic practices, um, and something that I think is overlooked often is how they exploit the crises. And so they, they appear very often as the saviors in the moment of crisis, but actually they benefit immensely um, from the financial crisis or the current COVID crisis. Very often these aggressive business models um, are built on aggressive funding models. So very often they're driven by VC funding um, that extract disproportionate value from other people's assets and labor. Um, and they tend to try to create global monopolies um, by either destroying or buying up competitors and often circulate venting regulation. Now, I'm sure these are all that none of these are new to you. Um, but what the cooperative movement um, did in a decade uh, around 2015 was really to put out a provocation and say, is it really the technology the cause of these problems or is it the business model on which they're built? And what if these businesses were collectively owned and democratically controlled? And so effectively, what if we manage this technology as a cooperative? And that's why I'll bring us back to the definition of a platform co-op, which is sort of merging this, the, the definition of the platform and the definition of the co-op that I gave before. And so what we mean by a platform co-op is a democratically owned and controlled business 
that uses an online platform or mobile app to trade, connect people and or pool resources and data. And so if imagine if, for example, Deliveroo was owned and managed by its riders, or if Spotify was owned and managed by musicians and listeners, or if Airbnb was run by local communities. What is exciting is that actually the cooperative movement is providing alternatives, um, the uh, ethical alternatives that are really careful with workers' rights and community rights and, and um, uh, producer rights. So we have Co-op Cycle, which is an international uh, platform for couriers. Um, we have Resonate, which is a, a platform for music listeners and uh, uh, pr uh, musicians, where both are members of the co-op. We have Fairbnb, which is a community-powered tourism, which is powered by, by local communities. Um, and so what, what the, the movement is trying to say is what, how would this technology change if we embed the cooperative principles into the technology that we use? I'm not going to go through all the, the principles because there's lots of information on, on our website and, on, and I'm sure Cooperative Development Scotland also provides information on the, on the principles. But just if you skim through them here, looking at the slide, what I think uh, is interesting is you can see how these principles don't only cannot, wouldn't only impact how a business is run, but also how technology is used and how we use data and process it and collect it. Um, and if you're someone who actually comes from the, the cooperative movement and is new to platform for businesses, I think it's interesting to see what technology could bring to cooperative businesses. And so here are just some aspects that have always been highlighted around the, the power of platform businesses. They tend to have lower startup costs compared to other high growth businesses. Um, they eliminate the middlemen, making direct connection, allowing direct connections between providers and receivers of a service. They allow autonomy where members can choose how much they want to use or provide a service. Um, they allow collective participation, making it more practicable and reducing the barriers for access and membership. Um, and then there's the network effect that allows reaching uh, uh, and scaling, uh, reaching new people and scaling is made much easier. So it's really merging these two worlds and understanding the potential uh, that uh, it can create. So here are a few examples of co-ops um, based in the UK that um, are either in our membership or we've supported. And I tend to um, distinguish in two types of platform co-ops. Um, here I've grouped some platform co-ops where it's really about connecting the providers and receivers of a service. Um, so, for example, we have Signalize for deaf people and British Sign Language Translators equal, that we'll hear from later, Equal Care Co-op, which is for caregivers and receivers, Red Brick Language School, which is an online English language school, and DOPO, which provides abortion care and education for all. And I've put just some quotes here to give you um, that have been provided by, by the, the co-ops, and I'll just read the, the one that's highlighted, which is from Equal Care Co-op. We want to see a care and support system which puts the relationship between giver and receiver first, shares power and allows care and support to exist in abundance. And I think this word power is really crucial. It's really uh, setting up a co-op is all about how you want to share and distribute power. And technology can allow us to do that if we do this and do it in the right way. Um, Another type of, uh, of platform co-op is what I tend to um, talk about as infrastructure co-ops, where the technology actually allows then smaller co-ops on the ground to operate together um, and, and also scale and grow. And so um, we'll hear much more from, from Kaylee later about Open Food Network, which is a network for ethical food producers and, and shops. Um, the share uh, technology across different countries. Um, Co-op cycles, similarly, the technology is internationally shared, but local worker couriers set up their own co-ops locally. 
And we have similar cases for car sharing where there's technology is shared amongst other um, uh, co different co-ops for, for creating car clubs. So a few words about how to start a, a platform co-op. So we've sort of mapped out the journey that a platform co-op um, might take, but every co-op is completely different. So this is just looking at some patterns that we've noticed in the, in the founder journey of, of platform co-ops. Um, but just please take it as, as, a, as an indication. It's not the only way to do it. Um, so we sort of divided the journey into, into three phases. There's an early phase that actually does take a, quite a lot of time and it really, really important to get it right, which is when you're exploring the idea of the co-op, you're starting to build your team, you're understanding if there's a case for the co-op that you want to set up, setting out your, your business case, your business plan. Um, and that will take usually around a year before you're actually ready to incorporate as um, a business, as a cooperative. Once you're incorporated, you can start attracting funding um, and, and that's where you start really to, you start your initial trading, you start testing your business case um, and building the technology. Usually within the second or third year, we've seen a few platform co-ops raise a share offer um, and so attracting equity to then be able to scale scale their platform. In the cooperative sector, there's a very specific type of equity uh, because as we mentioned, uh, people cannot invest in a in a co-op to just to um, uh, uh, just for profit. And so we have a particular type of um, equity that we suggest to co-ops, which is uh, we call community shares. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, there's a lot of information on this on our website, but just want to make you aware that equity raising in co-ops is different than in, in normal businesses. Um, so usually we see that in the pre-incorporation year, founders are able to attract around £15,000, usually um, either through grant funding or founder grants. And then from year one, year zero, where from when they incorporate and they can actually officially start uh, receiving grants as an organization, they'll probably raise around 75K. Um, and then a community share with a community share offer, there's usually a big jump that we go between 200 uh, with some actually raising up to 600,000. Um, our advice is really to start raising funds from before you even incorporate. Um, so you're starting immediately to think like a business uh, and not base it all on voluntary um, uh, work. Um, so, yeah, just start thinking from the beginning about your, your funding runway. These are just some numbers. I'm really sorry for some reason the years are not appearing here, but it was from 2015 onwards. Just to give you a sense of how much has been raised in equity. Initially, it was mainly... Um, media co-ops uh, that were operating online that raised equity and then we saw more uh, care, care co-ops um, and also uh, car car clubs with the highest raise being co-cars which was 600,000. Um, what is also interesting is that there is some institutional match funding um, and it's becoming more and more available hopefully uh, where if you're able to crowdfund the, the community shares from your community, there is uh, uh, some funders are prepared to also provide match funding to that. Um, moving on to the support available. Um, as I mentioned, I've been running the Unfound Accelerator, which is a program uh, delivered by Cooperatives UK and supported by the Cooperative Bank. And it's been completely focused on, on supporting the, the platform the cooperative sector. Um, I'm going to skip the next slide just so that I can move on quickly um, to the support that we're pro currently providing. So once a year, we run an accelerator program for platform co-ops, which is a 10-week business support program for teams that are at the early stage of setting one up. And it is accompanied by a pitch event uh, towards which the Cooperative Bank has contributed a 10,000 prize fund. Um, it's for teams of at least two members that are ready to set up their co-op that are looking to register in the UK by the end of 2023. And... 
the deadline for applications is really soon. So 5 March is the deadline for applications. So if you're watching this webinar and you're interested in receiving support as a platform co-op, please do uh, look at unfound.coop. The accelerator will run from um, the end of April to the end of June with the pitch event in the second week of July, the exact date to be confirmed. Um, we also have a lot of resources. So um, my colleague, Megan, Megan, who's very kindly helping out today, uh, will be pasting some of the resources in the chat. Uh, but we have a lot of information on our website and a regular newsletter where we also provide information about other events related to platform co-ops and funding opportunities. On Cooperatives UK's website, you can also find um, a step-by-step -step tool, which is generic for any type of co-op. So if you want to go with your own pace, you can just um, visit the, our website and follow the step-by-step -step tool. Um, but we also have for the further support between the two organizations. We have uh, Cooperatives UK um, a direct support program, which offers six days of support, of one-to-one uh, one -one support uh, and peer mentoring. We have an experienced advice team as well that can provide support. And also, as I mentioned, we have a lot of resources, but also funding for those that are interested in raising community shares. And as Susan, Suzanne mentioned earlier, for, for Scottish um, enterprises, there's uh, support available also from um, Cooperative Development Scotland. Um, final slide, and then I'll pause. And finally, we can hear our, our speakers, our, our, the other panelists. What is very interesting about the platform co-op movement, which is also typical of the co-op movement generally, is that it is an international movement. And the platform co-op movement is is quite active at an, at an international level because of the nature of platform co-ops that often tend to be, some of them tend to be international. So we'll be putting in the chat links to various ways in which you can engage with, uh, with the international network. I think that was my last slide, so I'll stop there. So thank you everyone for, for following that presentation. I know there was a lot to, to take in. Um, so let me just bring up so I think now we are going to hear from uh, Jennifer Bird, who runs Signalize, which is a, a platform co-op for deaf people and British Sign Language translators. I'll hand it over to you, Jen. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Vika. Uh, so yes, I'm Jen Bird, the Business and Development Manager at Signalize Co-op. We are a multi-stakeholder platform cooperative and our members are deaf users who are the end users or receivers of sign language interpreting, and then uh, the interpreters themselves. We also have a handful of other associated professionals like lip speakers and speech to text um, reporters and translators. Um, so this is an all too common story. We see this around once a month, sadly, in the deaf community where family members are relied upon to become um, sign language interpreters because uh, perhaps an NHS trust hasn't been able to source an interpreter. This can be down to many reasons. For example, the traditional delivery model has often been via agencies. These can be local or national charities, private businesses, um, or even very large global spoken language agencies who often have little or no knowledge about the deaf community. They quite often um, provide interpreting as well as a loss leader in order to gain business. So they're quite aggressive and competitive, yet they have very little experience of the market of sign language interpreting. Quite often these problems can occur because the staff turnover is high, staff don't know who holds the contract, and especially worse for the users who quite often have a lot of anxiety and it affects their well-being when they're on the way to, a, for example, a hospital or a GP appointment. So there was recent, or not so recent research from Sign Health who said that the NHS loses 30 million a year in misdiagnosis or lost appointments through not having appropriate sign language interpreting provision. So these are exactly the reason why we set up as a cooperative in order to solve these problems. So our solution is that we're using tech for good, which is the platform side. I'll talk a bit more about that later. 
as as we are cutting out the middlemen, we're sort of replacing the middlemen with us, the experts in delivery. So as a multi-stakeholder cooperative, the, the huge benefit to that is that we have regular user meetings with the deaf community, as well as um, on the worker side. So we're getting direct feedback about how the service is delivered uh, from both the receivers of the service and those who deliver it. At the time um, we were thinking about setting up, we actually went to a workshop held by Cooperatives UK. And I, at the time, was thinking very much of a workers' cooperative. And when I was told of the ability to have a multi-stakeholder cooperative, it blew my mind. Because having, having the deaf community actually involved in running a business has never happened on a community-wide basis ever before. We're, we're the only people that are doing that in the entire of the UK. So previously, it may be more like a charity model, where deaf users are beneficiaries, but they're not really consulted. Or usually private private agencies who don't have any kind of user involvement, whether that's on the worker side or the user side. So we're definitely unique in that in that sense. So we have regular meetings. We use sociocracy as much as we can to involve users in decision making. Um, and we use the prof any profits that are made are ploughed back into raising interpreter standards or using that funding to actually hold events with the community. Our journey very much fits in with what Vika was describing, um, so I won't go into it too much because we're literally pretty much on the money when it came to the community shares raise or the funding that we obtained in the first year um, from incorporation. So if I skip to August 2021, the community shares raise just prior to that we believe was a a large part in enabling us to win our biggest tender to date, which was a sole supplier on a large NHS framework of 19 NHS trusts across Merseyside and Cheshire. We're now on contract number seven as of December 2022 and hopefully more in the pipeline. Economy is a huge topic at the minute. We believe that we very much fit into what we would call the post-COVID economy, whether that plays out with the current government or the current situation is, an, is a whole other debate. But we very much fit into that ethos of um, public services uh, obtaining social value. So, for example, the framework that we went for had a 10 percent weighting for social value. So we think we one of the biggest reasons we got that place on the framework was because we were able to demonstrate the social value that comes from that the cooperative model in working and being owned directly by the community. So how do we compete? We have. Uh, a leaner business model, less admin fees. We're using tech for, for good. We're not um, trying to be a gig economy platform such as Uber or Deliveroo. And everything that we do is co-designed with users. We test everything. We go back to the users. We get feedback. We change what we're doing so that it suits. And that's all users, including the customers that we deal with. That's... The booking platform if you want to see that that's at beta.signalize.coop um at some point we'll transfer uh, um, over and make that our main site the majority of interpreters that we work with on merseyside are part of the platform one of the benefits and we consistently get good feedback from deaf users um is having the interpreter profiles on the website so one of the things we do that was very much driven from the community is when we book a sign language interpreter and a, for example, a GP practice contacts us, that's all done either via the platform or via the phone. Once we confirm somebody, we confirm that also with the deaf user. Also to my knowledge, nobody else in the UK does this. This is born out of a solution driven by the community. And based on that research I mentioned earlier about deaf people not knowing who their interpreter is going to be and whether one is even booked. And there are so many stories in the community about deaf people turning up at GP appointments and not knowing even if somebody's going to be booked, um, if they're going to have to go home again because there isn't anybody present. What we do is send a text message direct to the user and a link to the interpreter's profile. 
So very early on in the contract in 2021, um, one of the interpreters arrived at the, one of their booked appointments and the deaf user said, did you send me this text message? And the interpreter's like, what, which one's that? And the deaf user said, well, your face popped up on my phone and I knew that you were going to be at the appointment. And the deaf user had thought it was either the GP that had sent the message or the interpreter directly. And they were able to explain that actually, no, that came from the, the booking service. And the deaf user absolutely loved it because they knew A, somebody was going to be there and B, who they were. And C, that they could actually look them up on the website if they didn't know them and see their face, which for deaf people is a huge thing. It's a very visual thing. They want to see who's coming. This is consistently over the last 18 months of delivering these contracts, the number one benefit that deaf users always say they absolutely love it. It's made a huge difference to how they receive interpreting services. Um, so that the booking platform itself plays a, obviously plays a massive part in that. Um, we've done a lot of work tailoring the platform to make sure that it works for the NHS contracts that we have as well. And there's a lot more work to do on it and a lot more potential that we could um, could deliver with the platform as well as we've got huge plans um, and you can see on the navigation bar it says create a video booking we also are one of the only not the only service but one of the only services who have um, a video interpreting service that works side by side with the booking platform we use it quite a lot for perhaps a gp appointment where a member of staff hasn't um, remembered to book an interpreter or it works very well for things like A&E appointments where a deaf user might just walk in off the street and nobody knows that they're coming. Um, so, oh, I look quite tanned there. I'll have to get another tan soon, I think, so I look much better. But, um, and we're one of the only video services as well that in the second picture, you can see there's actually three users on the screen. The majority of video services only have two users and, the hearing person involved can't actually see what's going on. Whereas our service, you can actually have a three-way call with all people on the video screen. So you can see me as the interpreter in the bottom left, and then two screens, one for the deaf user and one for a staff member. Um, in a, using this kind of technology alongside the platform as well enables us to be really responsive as a service. Many video um, interpreting services are solely online and they don't have a face-to-face -face provision. So we're able to really offer choice to the deaf user. For example, um, we can do you, a, a GP appointment can be booked tomorrow via video or we can get someone face-to-face -face next week. And then it's always down to the choice of the staff member and the deaf user as to whether they want to hold appointments via video as well. So it makes us really responsive. So tech is playing a huge part in what we do in connecting people. So for us, um, it's about increasing our business, gaining more contracts in the same way. But also um, we've come to a time where it's important to review our strategy because the market is moving so quickly. And also we have some real challenges with things like the cost of living crisis. But as a multi-stakeholder cooperative, um, more specifically on the worker side, for example, we have regular meetings about pricing and fees where we can solve some of those challenges together and make sure that there's no drop in service and that everybody's happy with what we're doing. Um, we continue to evolve our tech in line with feedback. We have regular quarterly meetings, if not more often, with both user groups where we can gain feedback. And we also do a lot of outreach. We have an outreach worker who's deaf herself who goes out and the aim is to really increase the membership to about three times what it is of the worker members so that we can gain real user input and make sure they have a quality of, of say in how the co-op is run. Um, there's our contact details. I'm happy to answer anything in the chat, of course. And if you do want to contact us, please do. Thanks, Jen. That was very inspiring. Um, so please do please do use the chat for any questions, and then we'll we'll gather them at the end for a Q and A. So yeah, just please please do use the chat um, to interact with us. Uh, I'm now going to hand it over to Kaylee Reed, who's a member of Open Food Network, which is a co-op of organisations whose members collectively own and control an innovative software platform that they use to trade the food that they produce. It's great to have you here, Kaylee. Thanks for joining. 
Thank you, and thanks for inviting um, uh, us to present the Open Food Network today. I'm just going to share my screen. Wrong one. I always do that. Slideshow. Okay, so first thing to know about the Open Food Network is we're a global collaboration. Um, I think, Vicky, you mentioned uh, we're a network of networks, so we're like a cooperative of cooperatives. Um, we are founded in Australia, but now we're an international community and we operate in over, around 20 countries, but we're growing all the time. And essentially, we're a global community that are working together to develop shared resources, knowledge and software to support a better food system. And our flagship project is an open source e-commerce platform that's tailored specifically to community food enterprises. And people have used the software to set up um, food collectives, manage food hubs, and take their farmers markets online. So essentially you can set up an online shop on, with, with the software. So we're an open source technology, um, which means that it's not owned, anyone can contribute, and it also kind of hits the kind of open part of the open food network that we're an open community of collaborators that has grown around this software as well. We're a co-learning community, so we're not just a software, but we also focus on developing solutions to solving food system problems that isn't just with the software. Um, and so that can be everything from different projects, research projects, um, shared resources. So essentially anything that we can create as a global community that helps the wider community thrive. And then also we do that on like a local level as well. Um, and we're not just a community, uh, we're not just a business as well. We're a cooperative and we're governed sociocratically. Um, and that's been a kind of an ongoing process for us to see what that looks like in the open food network. We've been looking at in the UK, we've been working on our governance process a lot over the last year. Um, but in the way that we collaborate with the global community, everything is held in the commons. So what we create in the UK can then be used by other members of the network in other countries and vice versa. Um, we operate on an open and transparent governance model, not just globally, globally but locally as well. And we also use collaborative decision-making within our network of communities. So we work collaboratively with the people who use the software um, as well as members of the community. And most of our community is made up of people who are also food producers or running food, um, food enterprises themselves. And a bit about the founder story. I'm not a founder member, so I always feel like I don't quite do this justice, but we um, essentially were, um, started off with four people who were all um, working in and running or founding food enterprises, community food hubs in their communities. And they developed a software um, that was had lots of issues and was very buggy um, together. And then they were linked up with the OFN Australia and what was happening there. So this was really early in the project, I think 2015. So only a few years after the software had been developed in Australia. So um, the group of founders brought the software to the UK and gained funding for the first three years. So the Open Food Network UK launched. Then the pandemic hit um, and I joined the OFN just before the pandemic and it led to a massive amount of growth in a short space of time, um, which then led to more funding. And all these funding opportunities have led us to be able to build um, a reputation in the movement. Most of our revenue is through funding currently, although we... So we're free for um, some. It's free for someone to set up an, a, a shop front on the Open Food Network software, and we only start uh, asking for membership contributions when they're trading more than five hundred pounds a month through the platform. So it's very accessible um, to small scale producers and um, smaller community food hubs, and then we're also invested in uh, as a community in helping each other grow. Um, so this is our vision and mission. Our vision is we want to see healthy and connected communities co-creating more resilient, diverse and secure food systems that nourish everybody and regenerate the planet. And our mission is to support them to do that through our um, comments of software resources and community learning networks. And as I mentioned before, um, the way that we were founded and also the members who are part of the Open Food Network, um, everything we do is really grown from the real needs of food hubs and farmers across the UK and globally. So we're constantly developing the software to improve how it functions. And then also on top of that, we're constantly imagining new resources that we can share with the community. And yeah, um, building stuff, I've spoke about this before, so I'm just going to skip just where at the time and that we have some time for questions. So the Open Food Network UK, um, we're committed to non-hierarchical and sociocratic ways of working, and we're constantly developing this. 
um, in April last year, um, our CEO stepped down and is actually still part of the Open Food Network community, but focusing um, on the global community and the platform development. Um, so it means that in the in the UK, we've had to kind of re think how we organize together and there's now we've got quite a big team when we're all working there's around 16 of us in the coordinating circle um, that um, provide support services as well as help create resources for community members etc um, so it's been an interesting journey for us this year we're looking at lots of different ways of how we organize but we've landed on organizing sociocratically um, so we've we now operate in different circles in the team that fulfill different functions within the team and this is what the platform looks like on the first page that you'll come to. So you can set up a food, um, an enterprise. You can set up your online shop through the platform, but also as a shopper. You, a really cool feature is you can search for, oops. You can search for, um, you can search for local food enterprises near you. We currently have around 800 food enterprises that are using the software. So we've got this, map function so if you're a shopper you can see who or what community food enterprises are in your local area or producers and you can also search by text as well where you are and yeah i think that's it from me i want to keep it short and sweet because of um question time so i hope that's okay it's excellent and great to see the whole journey <laughs> it's so exciting how, how it's been growing um so yes please do put some questions in the chat there was there were two questions that were specific around community shares so i'll i'll answer those uh but if you have any questions for the other panelists do put them in the chat um direct them direct to the panelists that you'd like uh, the question to go to or if they're general questions about platform carbs more than happy to to respond um, so there was one question which was related to how do does institutional match funding work with community shares? So what is interesting about community shares and makes them very different from um, uh, shares in a normal company is that in, independently from how many shares you hold in the company, in the cooperative, you only have one vote. And so this really allows to bring in also big investors that are interested in supporting the cooperative, but don't necessarily are not necessarily looking to have a lot of control and power over the organization. Um, this is in, in very simple terms, they're, much, they're more complex uh, structures where um, in particular, as, as Jen was, was mentioning that you, you, you can set up a multi-stakeholder cooperative, where actually you have different member groups and it's not only the receivers and the providers of uh, the service, but there's what is often called supporter members. And so those are the ones that are investing in the co-op, but they're not actually transacting necessarily directly with the, with the co-op. Um, and so you can also weight voting based on, on, on the membership structure, but that's going into a, a, lot, of, a lot of detail. Um, unfortunately, the funding we currently can provide as much funding uh, through uh, the booster program that we have at Cooperatives UK is focused um, only on England, if I'm correct. Uh, it's also very focused up to now has been very focused on place based projects. Um, so actually, um, platform co-ops have struggled to receive the same uh, type of funding as other community projects that are usually related to saving an asset, et cetera. But having said that, what we do hold at Cooperatives UK is the, is the experience and knowledge of um, community shares and how institutional investors can get involved. So if you are talking with grant funders, for example, that are interested in investing in community shares, do we, we're happy to sort of support, um, uh, share our knowledge on, on how that can be done. Um, there isn't any specific grant funding for platform co-ops. Um, all the platform co-ops that I've seen that have been able to raise funding, they have raised it from really specific related to their sector. Um, unless there's a specific uh, tech for good funding grant, but um, but they're not necessarily just the fact that you're a co-op 
will make you access that grant. It's really what the purpose of, of your co-op is, if that resonates with the with the funder. Um, Suzanne, I don't know if you want to say anything more about um, funding available for um, co-ops in Scotland. I think you've just made the point I was going to make, Vika, in in that there's a real lack of fun, of cooperative specific funding um, available in Scotland. And what I found through my work here at CDS is, as you've just highlighted, it really does depend on um, the thematic and sector funding pots that are available um, for, for, for co-ops that we're working with. Somebody um, in, in, in the chat mentioned, you know, out with the community shares that the, the funding packages that you'd mentioned in your slides weren't available in Scotland and that is indeed correct. In terms of working with platform co-ops it really is a bit of a learning curve for us at the moment we've only been in this space for about 12 months and we're just sort of feeling our way based on the type and sector of, of, of the platform co-op that comes forward. We've had some some success stories around, around platform co-ops that was supported in terms of accessing funding from local councils who perhaps have a, a have funding pots available. We've worked. We're working with um, a platform co-op at, at the moment who's successfully um, mixed a, a variety and a blending funding package to get their co-op off the ground, including institutional finance, funding from a local authority, and doing a community share offer at the same time. So it's it, it's all really. We're just feeling our way um, a little bit, and we work with clients on a, on a sort of bespoke one-on-one -on -one basis. To, to, to plug them into support that's available. We, we use our own networks. We use the networks of our um, advisors and practitioners that we work really closely with as well. Um, but, but yeah, I think you, you mentioned the main point in that there's no, um, no specific funding pots for platform co-ops or indeed co-ops at, at the moment. They're, they're, they're mainly sectorally or thematic based. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And and just to reiterate, reiterate also the examples that Suzanne was giving, it's always a combination of, of funding, grant funding, revenue, partnerships with local authorities, never focus just on one. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's I'm sure Jen and Kay <laughs> know it's a, it's a hard job. Um, again, I will mention the newsletter, the Unfound newsletter, because whenever I see opportunities for that, I think could apply to platform co-ops I do um, add them there so do subscribe to that um, you can find it if you go to unfound.coop you will find um, a link to how to subscribe to that um, any other um, questions great well thank you everyone and thank you to our panelists uh, before I say goodbye I might just hand over to Suzanne in case you want to say a few final words um, as we wrap up well, thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for coming. And it was really just to reiterate what I said at the outset, um, not a one and done, not the end of the conversation. Uh, my contact details are in, in the chat and, and, and CDS is certainly here to, to continue the conversation with you and explore what potential next steps could look like. The other point I wanted to mention was um, often with these with these partnership webinars I think people might feel it's, it's one or the other it's potentially co-ops UK or, or CDS that isn't the case we work really really closely behind the scenes to to, to make sure any um, project or, or, or client that comes through either of our doors is accessing um, you know the, the breadth of support that's available from both of our organizations so I suppose that's a long way of saying no um, no wrong door, get, get in touch with, with either of us um, and, and we'll be keen to carry, carry the conversation on with you and plug you into uh, the relevant and available support. And thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for the panelists. Thanks really for your contributions. And yes, just to reiterate, we're here to support. So get in touch with both organizations and we'll make sure that uh, the best support is available for you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.